Good morning. So today we're going to talk specifically about advertising and the various types of media involved in advertising. And this is the part of marketing that everybody thinks of as being marketing. When we talk about channels, that's actually the oldest subfield of marketing. And that's the part of marketing, or in terms of academic marketing, that's the oldest subfield of academic marketing. And that's the part of marketing that nobody thinks about, how we get stuff to where people actually want it. But they always think about advertising, and advertising is actually one of the most interesting topics to discuss because we can look at ads and things like that. Because the uh, YouTube live will cut me off, um, I'm going to try one live ad that was an award-winning ad and see if it will let it go through. Um, but we'll look at some print ads from the past and see whether or not you think that they're great or not and what makes an ad great. And if you watched the lecture before, you, you got the idea of what makes an ad great. I have modified that slightly to include one additional element that I think is necessary to making an ad great or successful. So newspapers and magazines. Newspapers and print media are the oldest form of advertising. This has literally been around print media for centuries. The text says that they've been around for at least two centuries, but literally since the invention of the printing press, which I believe was in the Quattrocento, uh, we have had businesses use advertising to, to sell their goods or to get things out or for politicians or kings or anybody to be able to communicate their message, right? So it's an enormously old form of advertising. It's the one that's been around, you know, throughout uh, the, the longest um, in terms of, you know, from the beginning or the dawn of sort of marketing. And I see our, our uh, bulb is going in and out again. So maybe I'll turn this off so that you have a better shot at seeing the PowerPoint. Does that help? Yes. <clears throat> So, as I said, the text says it's one of the oldest forms. Uh, most of ad history, this is the only source. So, we are hyper-connected, um, but for most, of, for most of our human history, the written word was, was it. Historically, before the printing press, there were books. And how were books made? Well, you had people who actually literally hand-copied old versions of the Bible. Right, that that you might look at the Bible as being one of the earliest forms of marketing and the teaching of the Bible. Um, that's historically how colleges and universities got started. Was in uh, universities uh, that were that were part of um, the church. So this is really really old. It's also declining, but it's still important. Why is it still important? Even though newspapers and magazines are in decline, and lots of newspapers have gone broke, lots of small towns no longer have newspapers. In Guthrie, we have one newspaper. I can't, you know, I, I, I don't know that they print anything of, of substance. And it's really kind of sad, because if you went back to when I was vice mayor, and I was vice mayor at the turn of the century, um, and actually the century turns not in the year 2000, but you actually have the turn of the century in what year? Nobody knows this. It's what? 2001. It's 2001. Why is it 2001? Because there's no year zero. We went from one, right? Before the common era BCE to one, CE or common era. Um, that's the more modern uh, contemporary way of dating things is to say BCE before the common era and then the common era. It used to be that we'd say BC, which stood for before Christ, and then we would have one uh, AD, which stands for Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. So we went from one to one. There was no year zero. So in order to get to 100, you actually have to go to 2001, right? So I was vice mayor at the turn of 
of 2000 and then all through, uh, also through 2001 when we actually had the, the millennium term. And there were two newspapers in Guthrie and they actually, I mean, the, the internet was in its infancy. There was this idea in Y2K, you all are too young to remember this, that it was gonna crash and burn and maybe we wouldn't have anything left and planes would fall out of the sky and the waterworks would stop. But there were these newspapers in Guthrie, there were two of them now, there were down to one. I don't think it covers much of substance. And one of the reasons that it has died is because there was this guy who put something up on the internet and he was a philanthropist. And it's one of the creepiest websites that ever got put up, but, but his name was Craig and he started something called Craigslist, which you probably all, I don't, I don't, don't even remember because that's, you know, such ancient history. And Craigslist basically be, replaced classified ads. If you wanted to sell beds or, or, furniture or televisions or computers or things like that. In the past, before Craigslist, you'd take out a classified ad. If you wanted to sell chickens or, you know, horses or cars, you'd take out a classified ad in your local newspaper and people would look at it and they'd come look at your car and buy it. Now we have Craigslist, which is a, a technological version of the classified ads, and it's really affected a lot of newspapers. But in spite of the fact that they are in decline, they are still important there are still major newspapers in the major cities that cover news and, and, and provide ads. And why are they still important? There are still a lot of traditionalists who continue to read actual print media. They like print media. And there is some evidence to suggest that you retain things better if you actually touch it. How many of you actually bought the hard copy or got the loose leaf version of the text for this class, or how many of you have used the, how many of you got the loose leaf version? One, two, everybody else is using the E version. There's a lot of evidence to suggest that you don't retain what you read on an electronic form. And, and part of that is because all of your senses are utilized when you're using um, books. There's a smell, for example, to paper that it has, there's the feeling that it has that's different. Um, and so it utilizes all those senses. So it's still important, particularly among those traditionalists, but even uh, your generation, the vast majority of people still read at least one, um, one, let's uh, back previous, um, newspaper or magazine uh, a week. Um, there are publications for every single interest. So I am a commercial pilot. There's something called AOPA, which is the Airline uh, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association, which produces a publication. There's something called Controller, which sells uh, aircraft that produces publications and talks about things like that. So there are ones for every single interest. So they're still um, enormously important. The advantages of print media and online print media is it allows for a detailed presentation of information. Television is expensive. You have 30 second spots. You can't really tell people all of the benefits and features or features and benefits of a product, like let's say a car in a 30 second spot but you can tell them about it in a print ad in more detail. And if you went back in time and you looked at things like the Sears and Roebuck catalog and old newspapers, they were full of details about the products that they were selling. It's not as intrusive as television or radio. It's a high involvement media. You have to seek it out. Television and radio, you listen to radio. Actually, how many of you actually listen to radio in your car still? One, two, three. Most of us listen to our <coughs> digital media. I mean, the minute I get in the car, it automatically connects through Apple CarPlay and I just listen to, to my music because you know, I don't want to listen to all those ads. But um, historically, with regard to television and radio, it was foisted upon you. You have to seek out magazines. You pick up magazines. People used to do this. They used to have them in doctor's offices. I've noticed that nobody in doctor's offices put out magazines or books or anything like that anymore. But people used to actually go, you know, you go to the doctor's office and you'd sit there and you'd read Good Housekeeping or you'd read um, Better Homes and Gardens or things like that. 
Um, 90% of adults still read newspapers or magazines online or print at least once a week. You have a lot of selectivity with newspapers and magazines. So you don't see ads for airplanes on the television. And you don't see ads for airplanes on radio or hear ads for airplanes on radio. And you don't see them in most magazines and things like that because airplanes, you, you have to, you can't just go out and fly the plane, right? You have to have a pilot's license. Um, there are very few pilots in the world. So they're specialized. So you, you advertise in specialty print or online magazines like AOPA controller, and you have a selective capability. You're not wasting your coverage by putting out ads that, that you know, nobody's really interested in. You can target specifically what you want. You can have good production quality with print ads, particularly in glossy magazines or even online. You have a lot of creative flexibility. There is more permanence. Once somebody views a television ad and it moves on to the next part of the programming, it's over. It's vanished. They may or may not remember it, but if they have that magazine, they may flip through it again. It has a permanence to it. And there's a lot of prestige. There are still lots of people, again, who get magazines. If you go to Nichols Hills, there's a magazine specifically for Nichols Hills. And there's one specifically for, um, I think, Edmund. There's an Edmund magazine that, that they put out. And high-end designers and things like Edmund Furniture Gallery advertise in those. And you still see people picking those up and reading them. The disadvantages are that it can be enormously costly to produce, particularly physical print copies are expensive to produce. You can have limited reach with actual non-online publications. Online publications and magazines can change their content rapidly but actual, the actual print versions, you have a long lead time on those. Vogue. Vogue is still enormously popular, by the way. What is the big edition of Vogue? Anybody know what's the big fashion edition of Vogue? The one that all the designers want to be in? The one that's the one that they put, they start putting it together literally the minute the, the edition comes out for, for the next year, they start planning. Anybody know who is the editor in chief of Anna Winter? Anna Winter. Um, she wears dark glasses so that people can't. And she's uh, teaching a master class, by the way. It's the September edition of Vogue. That's that's the big one. And they so it's a long lead time that they start planning for that edition. And you can get a lot of clutter in magazines. You know, you can depending on where you are. If you're not near the front or the inside, if you're in the sort of the middle of a big, thick uh, magazine like the September edition of Vogue, um, you can get lost in that clutter. Radio. Radio was the first dynamic media for advertising. What does that mean? It's not static. So print is static. It doesn't change, right? It's it, what you have is what you have. Radio is the first dynamic in that it's, it's live or it's recorded and then broadcast. And so it, it you know, it, it can change. Radio is now viewed as old school. Before television, it was dominated by national accounts. So national advertisers advertised on radio during very prominent radio shows that they had that people would sit around and listen to the radio. There are still people who do this. They still listen to a lot of um, traditionalists. They listened, they grew up listening to baseball on the radio, and they still do that. I have a friend who's, he's not a traditionalist, but he grew up listening to the radio with his father, who was a traditionalist, and he's, um, he's a uh, baby boomer. And think about what year he was born, if he was on the cusp of being. He's a baby boomer, and... 
he grew up listening to the, to the radio and baseball with his father, and he still does that. He still listens to, to baseball games on the radio. And so uh, it was dominated by national accounts for people like that. And then um, when television came in, it became mostly a local source of advertising. So it's mostly primarily local. The advantages are that it's really cheap to advertise on the radio. Receptivity. Listeners view it as more personal and they have an emotional connection. People historically listen to their same radio show. I used to listen to radio shows that I didn't like because it just annoyed. It was, it's just like, have, have you ever had a program or something that you loved to hate? Anybody done that? That you just love? You just, it's, I love to hate Chick-fil-A. I love to hate Starbucks. I mean, like I, they just, uh, they, they're aggravating and but I love hating them and I used to love hating in the before we had you know Sir, I have serious uh XM radio in my car and like I said I don't even listen to that anymore because pretty much my car automatically syncs with my phone and it starts picking up the last song on my playlist that I that I was listening to but for years and years and years before we had this wonderful digital media that automatically sunk to your phone and you didn't even you don't even have to plug it in now I actually would listen to the radio on my morning commute from Guthrie to UCO. And there were these idiots on the radio that I still can remember. I think they're finally gone now. I haven't heard them forever. Jack and Ron. And Jack and Ron had opinions about every single thing under the sun, none of which they were qualified to comment on. But you do have a more personal, because I love to hate it. I did have this emotional connection. And I would listen to it and I would endure the ads um, because I just sort of loved. And I would sit there and scream back, you know, at, at Jack and Ron. What are you talking about? You're a moron. Do you have a PhD in psychology? Stop giving advice. It's like Delilah. I just absolutely, that's another one that I just absolutely cannot stand. Absolutely no qualification whatsoever to dispense. And she dispenses relationship advice. The woman has been married and divorced something like five times. Lady, you're not an expert on relationships. You're an expert on breakups, right? I mean, you're like, why are you giving advice? You have a lot of selectivity with radio. But it's a flexible medium. And it, it allows you, unlike television, you have to create the mental imagery for yourself. And so that makes it somewhat more um, high contact. It's, it's a lot like print ads. You have to selectively listen to it, and then you have to think about it for yourself, whereas television is going to tell you what to think about. The limitations are there's a lack of visual, obviously. So if you're selling products, people like to see products anymore. Aristotle says all men desire to know. And this is especially true when we think about the delight we take in our senses. And then he picks out a particular sense to focus in on in, in discussing this. And he says, we take particular love of our eyes and the visual. And radio doesn't do that. You have to see it with the mind's eye, whereas television does provide you with a visual. Print and online media provide you with a visual. Uh, you've got fragmentation. Radio stations are often local. Now, there are large national chains like Clear Station um, and things like that, but you've got a lot of fragmentation buying, making the buying process oftentimes complex for people uh, and for businesses. You have limited listener attention. The vast majority of people who listen to the radio now, it used to be, again, if you went back in time, people listened to the radio in their homes, and there were various programming. Um, if you've ever seen a movie called Little Orphan Annie, that actually started out as a radio show before there was television. And children and their families would sit around and listen to these radio shows, and they would have, and they would have advertising on it. Now, if you're going to listen to the radio, the vast majority of people listen to the radio where? In the car, right? So they listen to it in the car, and they're distracted because you've got all of these other things that you have to do while you're doing you know, whatever it is that you're listening to the radio. You've got to focus on the traffic and turning and where you're going to go and directions and things like that. 
The difficult, uh, there can be difficulty in decisions um, due to the large number of stations in terms of buying. Um, you have a lot of competition from digital media now, and you can get a lot of clutter in radio. Radio, however, has one specific advantage, particularly in political ads. There has been a lot of research to suggest that negative ads go over better on radio than they do on television because people, they, they don't experience as much because they are sort of, dis, they're distracted. They don't automatically experience cognitive dissonance if they hear a message that doesn't align to their particular political ideology. And so it can be a, a much more nuanced and receptive um, area for, for uh, political negative ads. And that's usually a test question. Television. When television started, it was called the ideal advertising medium. Why? Because it allows for a high degree of creativity. You can basically develop an ad that is a mini story. It's a little, it's like a little, you know, a little mini play um, where you can build suspense and, and tell, um, tell a tale, weave a, a good tale. So you have a lot of creative impact. For, it's expensive for television, but in terms of the coverage that you can get, it is very cost effective. If you want to run a national ad and sell national products like cars, it's enormously, it's enormously efficient because you're going to reach a huge, uh, large audience. You can get captivity and attention, particularly if people are dedicated to certain shows. And you can be selective in what you are, the ad that times that you're purchasing. We know that children view television programming at different times than adults. And so if you're marketing children's toys or um, products, you can do that at times that are highly selected, that they're going to be watching. Historically, when did kids watch a lot of television? After school, when else? When was the the biggest time? You all don't remember this because you don't. Saturday morning. Saturday morning. Saturday morning. Yeah, it was Saturday morning because that's when the cartoons came on. You both answered at the same time. So Saturday mornings were the big time. If you were going to market for Mattel um, or the big, you know, uh, toy companies or game companies, um, those were those were times that you would choose. You wouldn't choose, you know, eleven o'clock at night. Um, during the, the 11th hour with Brian Williams or something like that. The limitations for a lot of people, it's, it can be very costly, particularly putting together a good production. Television ads that are really, really creative require a lot of money. It can require sound, uh, you know, and studio stages and things like that. Obviously, you, you see car dealers and they advertise on television a lot. And that's less, but you still have to have a production unit to go out and film. Although those costs are coming down as we're able to all capture video and make production with a lot greater ease than it was in the past. Selectivity is both an advantage and a disadvantage with uh, television um, in that you can, you can be selective, um, but you may not get as much coverage as, as you want if you're, get, if you're, if you're, promoting a product, for example, that has a much broader reach than a narrow focus like children. If you're promoting something that is going to be used by everybody in the population, say toothpaste, for example. It is a fleeting message, meaning that once the ad's over and once you bought that time, it's, it's gone. People don't generally watch stuff over and over again. You get a lot of clutter because you get a lot of ads in, in a short period of time, and then you get programming, and then you get you know, you know, more ads. It's prone to zipping and zapping. So zipping is where you record the shows that you want, or anymore, you don't even record them. You buy them, or you, you subscribe to a service that's ad-free. YouTube, for example, will do, you know, if you subscribe to YouTube, ad-free ads. Zapping is where you just switch channels. The minute the ad comes on, you start switching between the channels. There's also a lot of distrust. And this is particularly true in the 
postmodern world and in the post-Trump world where he has convinced people that the media are lying to them. And so that can bleed over into a lot of other things. If you distrust the source of the message, um, that, that can have an impact, right? And so you will find that products that are not products like toothpaste, but there are products that are obviously more attractive to uh, you know, liberals. There are people, cars even have certain types of personalities that are attracted to various cars. One of the things that um, an author that I follow has written is that uh, the middle classes drive a Mercedes, whereas truly upper class people drive a Lexus. And it's, it's sort of new money that drives Mercedes because there's this impression that Mercedes is, you know, like this status luxury symbol, whereas Lexus is actually the better quality car. Um, so you can have a lot of distrust depending on which source of media you're using. Support media, billboards, mobile billboards, bus shelters, buses, restroom stalls, cars, trucks, and even people can be support media. We're marketers, we'll put ads everywhere. You've seen people standing out during tax time. How many of you have seen the people dressed up as the Statue of Liberty, you know, flipping a sign, you know, come in and get your taxes done. So we'll put ads almost everywhere. They put them up in um, restroom stalls and restaurants. Restaurants now sell space on their tables for advertisements or on their coffee cups for advertisements of local businesses. The gym that I go to has televisions up and they play ads on those televisions that they sell. There's a company that does um, mobile marketing uh, you know, in places like gyms where people are watching and, and they, they do ads, you can buy them. The advantages are you can have a wide coverage of lots of local markets, particularly for local businesses. The frequency is usually 30-day cycles, so you usually purchase these in 30-day cycles, so consumers are exposed many times. So you go to work the same route every day for the most part, and you pass by the same ads every day on billboards, which means that you are getting more than three exposure hypotheses. There's this idea, and it's been tested, that in order to get people to really understand or learn something, you have to expose them to it three times. Well, if you've got a billboard and people, the same people are driving past that billboard every single day, they're getting more than three exposures. You have a lot of geographic flexibility in terms of the ads that you, you run. Again, going back to my, I had a discussion uh, earlier in the semester about they asked children in Las Cruces, I think it was in the fifth grade, where they were most likely to see a boat. And those children in Las Cruces said on the highway, because Las Cruces is in the middle of a desert. And although the Rio Grande runs through there, by the time it gets down to that point, the Rio Grande, first of all, the Rio Grande is, is not like the Mississippi. It never was like the Mississippi. It was never that grand, right? But by the time it gets down to Las Cruces, it's gone through a lot of, you know, dams and, and people using it for irrigation upstream and so it's really not that grand so you, you don't even see boats on the Rio Grande and even if you saw a boat on the Rio Grande it would be like a you know rubber dinghy and somebody rowing um, it's not going to be like you know the 36 foot cabin cruiser that I used to own so they'd see boats on the interstate you ask a kid in Oklahoma where they're likely to see a boat and they're going to say on a lake because that's what we have in Oklahoma we don't have big rivers um, that you can put boats on. We have one navigable river in Oklahoma and they do bring stuff up and it is the furthest western most intercontinental point um, for shipping and it's called the Port of Catoosa in Tulsa but that's, you know, most people don't see that. They go to the lake, they go to Eufaula, they go to Lake Texoma, they go to Grand Lake and that's where they're going to see a boat. So you see Yamaha ads in Las Cruces, but they're not advertising for things like personal watercraft and boats. They're jet boats. They're advertising for quads and side-by-sides and things that you can go out and do in the desert. So you have geographic flexibility. 
The disadvantage is you have a lot of wasted coverage. If you go out on the Kilpatrick Turnpike, BC Clark has a huge billboard right as you go westbound. If you get off of Broadway and go westbound on BC on, on the Kilpatrick, BC Clark has this huge billboard for Rolex um, watches. You got a whole lot of people driving that turnpike that can't afford a Rolex watch, right? And BC Clark, so they're wasting a lot of coverage on people that, that go past that ads. And maybe it's not even that they don't, they can't afford it, but they're just not interested. Your generation has a tendency to not be interested in things like Rolex watches. You'd much rather have a watch that syncs with your phone and you can, you know, monitor your heartbeat and tell you how many steps you've taken and, and all of that, right? So you've got a lot of wasted coverage. The cost can be considerable to produce uh, the, the canvas for the billboards that they put up can be a lot of money. Um, you can get wear out and it's difficult to measure the effectiveness of billboard advertising. It's difficult to tell if people are actually buying because they saw your billboard. You can do some tracking, but it's, it's difficult. You, the best way to do this is they just do car counts on those, you know, of how many people pass by the billboard. But again, you're getting a lot of wasted coverage with that. The internet and social media and mobile media marketing. So on your phone, this is the fastest growing. There are multiple platforms. There's your laptop, your desktop, your phone, and now your smart watches and things like that. The advantage is it's a highly, highly flexible and it allows for micro targeting. This is what Facebook does. And it's one of the things that has become an ethical concern and major focus of congressional investigations into legislation. The algorithms that Facebook uses tend to push, for example, non-legitimate sources and negative news items. Why is that? I don't know. We have sort of a morbid curiosity. And so we, we tend to gravitate towards the negative. And so that algorithm pushes that and will push that to the, the forefront. And we can micro target with, with this kind of platform. You can watch what people are, you know, looking at. You can use big data to analyze that and then send out highly selective messages that will be effective to those groups of people. There's a movie about this called The Joneses where they micro-target in person, yeah. Uh, what do you think about um, the companies who, like those who sponsor, I guess, like, for example, like YouTubers, they'll get packages in the mail. For example, like, um, there's a company, Alani New, mm -hmm. and they're like supplements for like pre-workout or uh, protein powders, things like that. And then they get YouTuber influencers to promote the product. Mm -hmm. I think that's um, really, I mean, some of the first ones that, that became um, big in this were actually on a platform called Vine, which is no longer around. And like Logan Paul became a millionaire by doing the splits in various places with various products, I think. I think it's a really interesting way of advertising to get social media influencers to promote your product. Um, and it's a way, it's one of the things, I mean, there's, there's good things and bad things about all of this. One of the good things about this is that it has allowed for what we might call the democratization of advertising and allowing people like you, if you can, if you can figure out ways to make your YouTube channel unique enough, and, and believe me, I have no idea how people do this. One of the people that came to my end, so I think I've told you all before, we have the Stone Lion Inn, my family does in Guthrie. We're, if you Google Oklahoma's Most Haunted, it's one of the first properties that comes up. And we have a lot of ghost um, hunters that come. We've had been on Ghost Adventure and Ghost Hunters and now we have all of these people that are YouTube personalities that do this as well. And one of the ones that came, and I can't figure out how he got the number of followers he got, is a, a guy named Ice Poseidon. And he started out by 
recording and on YouTube, his playing of a certain video game. And I can't even remember which video game it was and giving people advice on how to play that video game. And my nephew watches this stuff like for hours on end, right? Like, I mean, and I'm just like, how do you, like, why do you care? You know, I mean, like, why is this so fascinating? But that's what he started out. And then he moved on to eating food and getting people's reaction to him eating food and like literally thousands of views. And I'm like sitting there going, I, I have no idea why people want to watch this, but they do. And now he's gone on to ghost hunting and ghost, you know, and he showed up and the day he showed up to film at, at our location, he had just purchased a brand new Tesla. Um, and it wasn't the, it wasn't the model, three is that the smaller one it was the model s which was the large tesla so i i mean i think one of the things that's interesting about this is that it allows for people like i mean if you can figure out how to capture people's attention you can then make money not just on youtube but by getting sponsors who will who will pay you to promote their products on podcasts on your youtube channel on things like that and that's really fascinating to me because it used to be that advertising was dominated by a few small firms and, and it was uh you know it was a highly technical but now you if you all can figure out how to do this and and get a big enough following you can then start getting sponsors who will pay you to do that and and promote their products so i think that's that's great i think the disadvantage of that is is that people have a tendency to think all opinions are equal. And because it's on the internet, it must be valid. And this, this happened with one of my mother's employees. She was, she was talking about some conspiracy theory that she had heard about the, the COVID vaccine that they were putting microchips in it and they're gonna track you. And again, if you believe that, like they do that already. Like the government can track you already. It's called your phone. If you have a car that has any kind of, you know, OnStar or geolocation services, you are being tracked. You are being photographed. Literally, when I started teaching marketing um, 15 years ago, uh, I started out, I remember, as a political scientist, so I've taught for a lot longer, but I think I've taught marketing for about 15 years now. That at that point in time, the average American was photographed 50 to 60 times a day without even knowing it. And that's sort of discomforting if you think about it until you think about what it is today. Do you know how many times you're photographed today? Hundreds of times a day. Every time you leave your house, banks have video cameras up at their drive-ins. Businesses have video cameras up. Every time you go into a convenience store, they have video cameras up. Walmart has video cameras up in the parking lot. We have video cameras on every building on this campus, particularly on Bronco Pond, because they want to be able to catch you if you decide to go swimming. I, I don't know why anyone would want to do this. But, you know, I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds of times a day you are being tracked. And so, you know, she's coming up with this conspiracy theory and she talks to my mother and my mother's like, she's like, well, I saw it on YouTube. And my mother's like, Amanda, for God's sake, Grant has a YouTube channel. As if like nothing I say could possibly be legitimate on my YouTube channel. You know, I'm just foisting out, you know, bad information according to my, you know, I guess and I was like horrified that my mother says this. But so I think that's, that's one of the problems is that everyone's an expert now and everybody's opinion is equal and that's not true you're entitled to your own opinion it doesn't mean it's right or it doesn't mean that it should be given the same weight as you know somebody who holds an advanced degree in a, in a topic but we as a society have chosen to believe that and people believe that and so I think it's great that like you all have the opportunity to pay for your college. And like literally, again, I, I, I have a friend who 
He started a YouTube channel in the early and he he's made money. He's not made a lot. He's made like a hundred thousand dollars a year. He's not doing what ice Poseidon is doing apparently, but six figures, you know, for going out and doing what you want to do is not, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but there is a tendency to believe that everybody, because they're on online, that they're that they're legit. Um, it's enormously cheap to put these ads together, right? You can do it yourself. They have programs that will help you do it, and you can put them up on on Facebook and all these other social media platforms for just not very much money. And you can micro target. You can tell them the parameters of people that you want to see those ads. It's easy to measure. You can measure clicks through, right? You can say, I, I paid for uh, Facebook to promote my ad to at least 100,000 people, and I got you know, 20, 25 click-throughs, and of those, I sold you know, 10 products. Yeah. There are like there are apps like you can stuff stuff like Macari. You know that you know how many people viewed it, how many people have it, you know, parts. Oh yeah, and they they do extensive measurement, not just on how many click through, but not how many people view it. But we can even tell how much time they spent on that app. Just like I can tell how much in my online classes, how much time students spend, you know, in the D2L course shell. And one of the things that you know they start saying, I'm not doing well on the test. Well, I noticed like you know. On McGraw Hill Connect, you literally took five minutes to do, you know, all of the exercises. That that to me says you're clicking through, um, and and just redoing it, right? Um, so it's easy to measure. It's very interactive. It allows for you to participate and communicate back with the advertiser and with the company, which is something that you didn't get with television or radio or newspaper. You didn't get to give feedback. And we can get that feedback instantly now. So it's enormously interactive and dynamic. The disadvantage is there's a lot of clutter. There's lots of, you know, they're putting more and more ads on the social media platforms. There are lots of privacy issues associated with it. And we're going to see, I think, a lot of changes in the law regarding those privacy issues. There's the potential for deception and the potential for scamming people, you know, getting them to, to buy fake products or services and not delivering and then, uh, you know, vanishing. And that's hard to control. If you're in the United States, they can go and arrest you. But, you know, if you're in, you know, some other, other country and you're scamming people, you know, how many of you have gotten these emails, you know, dearly beloved one. This, I love how they start out with this stuff. They, they use language that no American would ever use. Dearly beloved one, I am Mrs. So-and-so of, you know, the kingdom of Andorra. I have inherited $15 million, but I need a bank account to deposit it in. I'll share my, you know, my inheritance with you if you'll give me your bank account number. Okay. And people have fallen for that. So there's the potential for deception. Also, people become irritated with it and they start tuning it out. Just like they zip and zap through television ads. So what makes an ad great? I talked about this uh, on the video. I'll, redundancy is good. It engages the mind of the consumer. It delivers a selling message. And it doesn't have any negative connotations is what I'm going to say. Now, this can change over time. And we're going to see that some of the ads of the past, I think, you know, would be highly offensive today, um, but maybe weren't at the time. So let's look at some ads and see what you all think. The first one. Begin early, shave yourself. This was a chic ad. Is this a good ad? We all love babies, don't we? I love, I, they used to have tire ads where they'd sell tires with little babies with little angel wings sitting in the tire and floating, you know, and it's like, keep your baby safe. I don't know. Lots of, ooh, the leaps in logic for that just sort of were incredible to me. What do you think of this ad, good or bad? Bad. Why do you say bad? Because a lot of people would be horrified to see their baby holding a razor. And I mean, it looks like one of the ones where it had like the um, the single blade that you change out. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's a chic razor. Yeah. So, you know, I don't think a lot of people want their babies holding razors nowadays. Just for fear. In of the past, though, like, you know, we gave kids all kinds of stuff. Like lead toys. 
you know. <laughs> so here, play with this. It's it's entertaining. I agree with you. It's probably, I mean, today this ad would never work. I feel like it's a girl. I don't think so. I think that's a boy. I think that's a boy. But look at her dress, like the cap she's got. Yeah, they used to. Babies used to be, I mean, like in the 1940s and 50s, the dress was considerably different than it is today. And actually, it's changed over time. Did you know that um, historically pink was a, a, a male color and blue was a feminine color? And that's totally flipped. Um, and I can't remember where that happened, but like, you know, and so I, I think that's a I think that's a male baby. But, you know, maybe not. So you think it's a girl? I, I don't think it's a terribly terribly effective ad, but does it um, engage the mind of the consumer? I think it does, but does it deliver a selling message? Not sure it delivers the selling message. Does it have any negative connotations? In in the modern era, I think we would think that probably it does because like people are horrified that you. Would, would do this to, you know, or let your baby anywhere near a razor like that. The best things in life come in cellophane. <laughs> cellophane. Like saran wrap. You know? The best things in life come in cellophane. It kind of gives the, um, um, the, the image to you know the baby's an amniotic fluid or something like that. I, I don't know. I think most people, it, we, we now know like, you know, cellophane, plastic, and babies are probably not good combinations. <laughs> but it, it, I think it engages the mind of the consumer. Does it deliver a selling message in the past? Maybe. Again, you know, people love babies. What is the farm doing? It's a stork. That's a historic, like babies. That's what that's what American families used to tell babies. Babies came from storks, right? Before, before we had the sexual revolution of the 1970s, when we were there were there were all kinds of even when I was growing up, um, the first couple to be seen in bed together was um, a program called the Munsters. They were the first ones. They were kind of like an offshoot of the Adams family, that kind of genre. And they were the first ones to be seen in, together for years and years and years. The, you know, the censors in the United States insisted that if you showed a couple in a bedroom, they had to have twin beds. Um, and both of them always had to have one foot on the floor. You couldn't have you couldn't have two people in, in bed together. They both had to have one foot. So like, you know, so parents used to tell their children when they'd say, where do babies come from? They would say the stork brings them. H how we got that mythology, don't, don't ask me. I, I'm not sure. But that's, that's what it is. It's a stork. Do people today know about a stork thing? I don't know. Did you all hear the stork? Yeah. Yeah. So there was like a commercial with like a bird carrying babies when I was a kid. I don't really remember it, but I feel like I've seen it before. I mean, there was a movie recently yeah. that came out and like they made a play on like the storks. It was a kid's movie about how the storks deliver and they delivered the wrong baby. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. They have something similar like in the Grinch. They use the yeah, little. You're right. Uh, umbrella to like float the baby down instead of like a stork. Yeah. Full of charming chubby sized clothes, Lane Bryant. What do you think of this one? She's it... not very chubby. She's not very chubby. <laughs> yeah. She's not very Those chubby. Sizes. No. Um, I think most of us would be horrified at this ad today. I'm not sure it was effective back then. This one for hot dogs. <laughs> what do you think of that? Yeah, the family's creepy. I mean, you know somebody's psycho when you can see the whites all the way around their eye, right? I mean, like, 
<laughs> and wow, dad looks particularly, you know, psychotic or homicidal in that. Like the hot dogs are the last thing I would even notice. Yeah. <laughs> you're you're more focused on like why are they looking like that? Yeah. I, I, I like what's up with the yeah. with the uh, creepy the like creepy said, eyes. I feel like that might work especially good for someone like me because I feel like my sense of humor is kind of worked. I find this I find this <laughs> true. Hilar- I find this hilarious. <laughs> Like, you find that it's so I find this so funny. This probably would make someone like me go out and buy hot dogs. And that would be really, oh really funny. I don't know why. I, yeah, I, I mean, they seem to be enjoying the hot dogs. <laughs> uh, everybody seems to be like fixated on them. So uh, I don't know. It'll, it'll certainly stick in your mind. Yeah. yeah. This one I love. If your husband ever finds out you're not store testing for fresher coffee, if he discovers you're still taking chances on getting flat, stale coffee, woe be unto you. For today, there's a sure and certain way to test for freshness before you buy. Chase and Sanborn Coffee. Don't know what the photo has anything to do with the coffee. Well, it, it suggests that it suggests that your husband is going to, you know, spank you if the coffee is. I, I guess I don't know. Like two different extremes, like yeah. capital punishment for not <laughs> testing our product. I think it's corporal punishment. Corporal, corporal, corporal yeah. cat, like he's not killing her <laughs> over yeah. this, but I like it is. Yeah, yeah. I, corporal thinking. punishment. What? I don't know what he keeps thinking. He's thinking his wife is true. Drinking his coffee. <laughs> That's <I guess>. true. <laughs> uh, does it um, does it engage the mind of the consumer? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I guess. Does it deliver a selling message? Not definitely. It distracts from the message. I, I don't know. Go back to the 1950s when this ad came out, and, you know, I, I'm not sure. It's kind of like. It's fear-mongering. certainly got negative connotations. What? It's kind of like fear mongering. Like, if I was a woman and I saw this, I'd be like, oh, crap, I better buy that coffee. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't know. I think we it definitely in the modern era has severely negative connotations, doesn't it? Misogynistic connotations. This one. Smell like a man, man. Old Spice. Old Spice was viewed among my generation as this was their attempt to rebrand and reposition their brand. So we talked about targeting and positioning before. This was their attempt. My impression of Old Spice was it was what my grandfather wore. And like, yuck, I don't want to smell like my grandfather. So this was their attempt to come into sort of the more contemporary era and, and, um, and you know, provide a product that would be attractive to younger people. And it somewhat worked. They're, they have a lot of shelf space. If you go to Walmart, in terms of Old Spice, it's no longer just Old Spice was a, an aftershave um, that my grandfather used. It's now uh, shampoo, body wash, uh, yeah, conditioner, all of that. Um, they had whole ads with this television ads where he would, you know, drop into various different scenes of, uh, you know, sort of um, what are historically masculine, um, you know, sort of settings and, and, and promote it. So let's watch if I can get it to play. It, it may not cut us off because it may, if I stand over here.
This man right here is my great grandfather. This man right here is my great grandfather. This man right here is my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats, don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs, well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you, you hear the stories, it's... I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. EDS, managing the complexities of the digital economy. That was a um, Super Bowl. The yeah, is Ross Perot's company. He ran for president. He was a billionaire. He was the first billionaire to run for president. And uh, this was an award-winning ad during the Super Bowl. But I'm not sure it delivered a selling. It engaged the mind of the consumer. It's clearly funny, right? When, when they say, you know, anyone can herd cattle, but bringing a herd of long hairs into town, and when you ain't lost to one of them, I'm living the dream. I mean, like there's, you know, there's, there's, this, there's this cognitive dissonance that you experience with between the Marlboro man and, you know, sitting there brushing a, a cute little, you know, fuzzy kitty. Um, but nobody remembered the company afterwards when they, when they tested it, like everybody remembered the ad, nobody remembered the company or what they were trying to sell. Right. So I would say that one, that's a classic example of it. Very creative, engages the mind of the consumer, failed on delivering a selling message. It didn't, however, offend anybody. I mean, it's one of the ones that I think is, you know, like it's just a funny ad. Lots of funny ads offend somebody. Um, there was a, and I tried to find it to, to play it for you. Do you remember the Dr. Uh, Pepper 10 commercials that they had? This was probably 10 years ago. So you all would have been really young, but Dr. Pepper came out with a low calorie soda and, and they deliberately like targeted it towards men because there was this perception among men that only women drank diet drinks. And so they went through this whole thing with this ultra hyper, you know, alpha male type personality, Rambo going through the desert, talking about how Dr. Pepper, it's 10, it's not for women. Um, you know, it was funny. It engaged the mind of the consumer. It was highly offensive. And, and, to the point that I think you eliminated, you know, 50% of your potential audience who would, who might, who might drink it. All right. Well, let's see if you got ducks come up and see me so I can give you points. We'll begin on Tuesday with personal professional selling. Close that. Close that.